Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Back for the afternoon programs here, July 1st, 160 years ago, right? All right, we're honored you're back with us today. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Wayne Motts, and it's my honor to be the President Chief Executive Officer here at the Gettysburg Foundation, which is the nonprofit partner of the Gettysburg National Military Park and Eisenhower National Historic Site. So I just want to thank uh, our partners. Make sure, make sure I get it right, guys. Jeff will help me back there. If I can mess it up, it'll get messed up, guys. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Steve Sims, the superintendent, Gettysburg National Military Park, his entire team, Chris Quinn, the chief of interpretation, our co-sponsors uh, for this event in the Park Service, of course, out on the battlefield, running battlefield programs. We're having programs here for those of you uh, that wish to be here. So real treat for us here this afternoon, and let's talk a little bit about Ronald Coddington who's going to be our next speaker on the topic, Civil War Portrait Photography. First collections of Civil War photos were those who lived during the four-year struggle. As the years ticked away and they passed from the scene, their likenesses were handed down through generations. Some remained with families. Others landed in the antique shops. Many were lost to the elements or tossed in trash heaps. During the war's centennial, a new generation rediscovered these intimate artifacts Today, a vibrant community of collectors are caretakers of these portraits. In this talk, Ron answers key questions. Why do these images exist? What were the popular formats of those images? Why did they pose this way? How did the war impact portrait photography in both the North and the South? And now a little bit about of our presenter, Ronald S. Connington, is the editor and publisher of Military Images Magazine. Now listen, I get a lot of Civil War magazines. If you want to subscribe and get a magazine that you're going to open up, every day you're going to get a new adventure. Get the quarterly Military Images Magazine. Go to Military Images website and be a subscriber there. I just got my new recent issue, which has a great article on the National Cemetery here at Gettysburg by collector Charles Joyce a person I know, a friend of mine. So uh, th this is great that we've got a magazine dedicated to these images. The Military Images Quarterly Magazine, which showcases, interprets, and preserves Civil War portrait photography. Ron is the, is the author of five volume series, including Faces of the Civil War, published by Johns Hopkins University Press. His writings have appeared in New York Times, Washington, uh, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, the Civil War Monitor, Civil War Times, Civil War News, and others. His latest book, Gettysburg Faces, Portraits and Personal Accounts by Gettysburg Publishing Company, and you will be able to purchase copies of it after this presentation right behind me inside the building. So he's only going to give away part of this, right, Ron? You're not going to give away all of it. You've got to get the whole book to see it all. And I, I hope you'll all help me welcome Ronald Coddington, the editor of Military Images Magazine, everybody. All right. Hey, all. How are you doing? Excellent. Thanks for being out. Some pretty good weather here today. Let's see. I've got to make sure I understand how to use this. All right, let's get right into it. Wayne, a big thank you for the introduction. Thanks to everybody outside at the Gettysburg Foundation. You guys are, these guys are terrific. I love everything you do. And I love all of you for being out here today. I want to start this talk, and I want to take you to August of 1863. Civil War battlefield photography. This is an incredibly important month for Gettysburg because you see your first newspaper articles showing up in northern newspapers offering stereo cards, those three-dimensional stereo views of the Gettysburg battlefield taken by Matthew Brady's team and Alexander Gardner's team. Later in August of 1863, Harper's Weekly, the North's illustrated news magazine, does a collection of engravings based on some of the Brady photographs that were taken here just days after the battle. 
So those images, and I have a few of them that you can see here to give you a flavor of what those images looked like at the time, they are the first time that they entered the popular culture, the first time that your great, great, great grandparents had a chance to see them goes all the way back to just a month after the battle. Now, as time goes by, those same images, they resonate with the generations that follow. In 1894, the Memorial War Book comes out with a few thousand Civil War images as the veterans are aging. Again, in 1911, Miller's photographic history has thousands of images from Gettysburg and other battlefields and other camps and campaigns throughout the southern states and, of course, here in Pennsylvania and Maryland. 1953, we're getting a little closer to the modern times. Divided We Fought does the same thing. 1960, the American Heritage Picture History. That's the book that I know that I had when I was a kid and spent so much time going through it. Then in 1975, a guy that you may know, another book that touched me, a man named Bill Frazzanito, he takes a very different look, retracing the journey of the photographers pinpointing locations on Gettysburg's battlefield and later Antietam in his book, A Journey in Time. A number of folks, and I dare say some of you in this room, also became very deeply interested in learning more about Civil War battlefield photography thanks to the work of Bill. One of those disciples was a guy named Harry Roach. And Harry looked at these photographs of here in Gettysburg and elsewhere, and he thought, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if we did the same thing for portrait photography? And so in 1979, he established Military Images Magazine with the sole purpose of doing the same thing for portrait photography that Bill Frasnito and all those who came before him did for Civil War battlefield photography. So here's just a few of the millions of faces that are with us today. Now, I want to spend this program going over four key questions because when you leave here today, I'm hoping to arm you with the knowledge you need when you look at Civil War portrait photographs, you understand why they exist and other aspects of them. So here's those four questions. Why did they exist? As Wayne said, what were the popular formats? Why did they pose this way? And how did the war impact portrait photography? So let's start with the beginning. Why do they exist? You have to go all the way back to 1839. Do people know this guy, Daguerre? A few people in the audience do. He invented, it was the first commercially successful photography invented by this man. He wasn't working alone. For decades and centuries, there was interest in phosphorus chemicals. There was interest in something called the camera obscura that artists used to trace images. He is the man who was able to put together a successful combination of chemicals and a silver plate with a copper background that was enabling folks to make portrait photographs just common folks. Think of it as the invention of the internet. It was that big and bigger. It revolutionized our world. All of the early images from the 1840s into the 1850s, all the images that you've seen in your history books, they are most likely daguerreotypes named for daguerre. At the same time, the first war photography shows up, and this is a unique image of the Mexican War, and it was taken by sort of a random photographer standing on top of a roof somewhere, looking out over Union or US troops marching through town. This is not a systematically photographed war. This is a war of chance, where photographers happen to be in the right place at the right time and made a photograph. The daguerreotype into the 1850s is really your only choice to have an image made. It's the most popular choice. But 
in the mid 1850s, as they're trying to make more of a business out of photography, they start to figure out ways to make photography cheaper. So in 1853, they figure, well, you know what? That silver and copper plate, and it cost about $2.50 to make a photograph. What if we substitute glass instead of silver? That's going to bring that price down in half. And then in 1856, in America, here in, in Ohio, over there in Ohio, an um, uh, uh, enterprising young man says, you know what? Let's get rid of the glass. That's expensive. Just use an iron plate. And they come up with the tintype. Meanwhile, while all this is going on in the 1850s, as technology is changing the photography and changing the world, there is a radically different view of what photographs ought to be. As early as 1839, months after the Gary type is discovered, a magazine in England says, you know, there should be other ways to use photography, not just for portraits, but you could use them, for example, to catch criminals. In fact, it goes so far, they begin to think about it sort of like we think about artificial intelligence today. Some of the writers imagine a place where the photographs are being made as soon as the crime is committed, and the photograph is at the police officer's station by the time the criminal is brought in. So reality is starting to become distorted, and a lot of folks are fearing that it's going to upset the balance. What happens to human beings in all this? Well, I don't know. We're asking the same questions today. 1851, a French magazine sort of extends this idea of the utilitarian qualities of photography by saying, you know, you could put photographs on business cards. You could put them on passports. You could put them on hunting licenses. It's this whole idea of personalization, using photographs to personalize legal documents. And then in 1855, a British journal says, says it in a, more, in a slightly different way, it talks about turning our attention to the employment of photographers, again, of this utilitarian class. And by that, he means, for example, the traveling salesman, rather than being in a wagon loaded with goods, just have some photographs. It makes life easier. You can see where this goes, right? <laughs> this is where we are today. So it's not a new idea. It goes all the way back to the origins of photography. And this is how photography has contributed to your lives today. That same British magazine, they're poking fun at us, as often happens. The Yankee man of fashion, it is said, does not descend to the prosaic plan of engraving his name on visiting cards, but fills his card case with photographs of himself, which he hands out instead. You know where this goes. <laughs> this is us today. Photograph albums and Facebook. This is the social media of the time period. Now, while all this is going on, the daguerreotype is still the king. These beautiful, artisanal, one-of-a-kind photographs, you don't make copies of them. They're beautiful works of art to be cherished. But while the daguerreotype is going on its way, an old format is revived. If we had music right now, we'd be cueing the sort of spooky music. Because you're wondering, what's going on here? It's this guy, William Henry Fox Talbot. The same year that Daguerre has his success, Talbot comes up with his own process. It involves a crazy idea of a negative from which numerous prints could be made, right? Shocker. Well, the prints are really not that good. They're good, but they're not as beautiful as a daguerreotype, which may explain why Tabit is pictured here in a daguerreotype. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. Not entirely fair. Here he is in one of his own prints. It still looks quite lovely. But there were some problems with his process. And in the 1850s, while they were talking about this idea of the utility of photography and personalizing photography, this guy says, hey, listen, Mr. Talbot, I like the idea, but why don't we 
try glass plates um, for the negatives because it will make it look sharper. And the chemicals you're using, I don't really like them. Let's try this product called Collodion, this cocktail of chemicals that I created. We're gonna put all that together and see what happens. Meanwhile, over in France, this guy, Everard, he comes up with his own invention, albumin paper, this beautiful fine paper that's treated with egg whites. It looks marvelous. It accepts the negative quite nicely. You can make great prints off of it. So here is one of those prints that includes albumin paper, the new chemical glass negative process. It looks as good as a daguerreotype. You're, uh, as you can see, you're looking at the Crimean War. It's beautiful, beautiful images. I shouldn't say beautiful images of wartime, but that's what we have here, beautiful landscape. We also, at that time, the Crimean War, we begin seeing photographs not of the colonels, the generals, and the admirals. We begin seeing the common soldiers, the lower-ranking officers, the enlisted men. And we begin to see, hey, these are people. They're persons, and they're customizing the way they look and the way they feel. Now, this guy, this Frenchman, Dittery, he comes up with his own invention. And it starts out, you might argue, a little bit of a joke. Remember earlier when that one guy in the British Journal was talking about putting your, name, putting your face on a visiting card? Those Yankee, those crazy Yankee men and what they're doing? Well, he takes it seriously, and he comes up with this invention, which is a camera with four lenses. It can take four photographs at one time. So imagine the glass negative divided into four, four portraits of one person. You make a print, you cut it in four, you take each of those baseball card sized prints, put them on a card mount, and you have cartes de visite, which means visiting card in French. The idea doesn't really go very well. It's slow to catch on, but it begins to gain traction. He puts out his invention in 1854, so slowly 1855, 1856, 1857, it begins to take off, and then in May of 1859 in Paris, the emperor and the empress waltz into his studio, and they say, I'd like to get one of those newfangled carts de visite made. And of course, everybody in Paris, everybody in France, they want to have it done too, because the royalty has had it done. The next summer, the same thing happens in London. This whole idea of having your face on a baseball card size visiting card becomes all the rage, and it's actually called this. <laughs> you can look it up. Cardomania sweeps across Europe, and of course, it comes to the United States shortly after. So cardomania is huge. And I'll tell you this too. Um, throughout most of the rest of the world, the carte de visite is what the name is known by. In America, we, you know, we like to do it our own way, and so we call them card photographs. Call them what they are, they're card photographs. Now, all of this is unfolding. The card photographs, or carte de visite, is landing in America just, and getting popular, just as the storm clouds of civil war are coming across the nation. So you can see these advertisements here for the first albums and advertising these images to be made. So that's, that takes us up to the Civil War. What were the popular formats? This is a little bit of review of what I just talked about, but I think it will help you to better appreciate these images. Now, I want to start with the carte de visite, these albumin prints, these paper images. As I mentioned earlier, it's the Facebook of the 1860s. These were done for public consumption. You purchase them by a dozen, two dozen, three dozen. You'd sign your name on it. You'd write a poem to your girlfriend or your boyfriend. Um, you'd write funny sayings on the back. Or if you were a soldier, you would sign your name and your rank and your regiment, and you would hand them out. So many of these images were made early in the war that they began piling up on parlors and bureaus and elsewhere. Way out on the frontier, there are stories of uh, primitive-made desks st 
stacked high with card photographs. And so these, again, this is the social media. You would pose for one of these images with that in mind. I love this description. This comes from the Encyclopedia of 19th Century Photography. I think it really gets at the heart of what they are. Small, ephemeral commodities, widely available, easy to hold, easy to pass around, easy to look over by the dozen within a drawing room, touchy-feely artifacts, not to be looked at with deferential awe, which is to say, we're not looking at George Washington or anyone else here, we're looking at regular folks. We look at them, you catalog, you collect them, you gossip, and you comment upon them. By 1863, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great thinker, uh, has his hand in so many different things. He says, card portraits, using our American version, as everybody knows, have become the social currency, the sentimental greenbacks of civilization. This is currency, they carry some weight. It's an expectation now over a few short years when you walk into somebody's house or if somebody asks you, you better darn well have that card photograph ready to give them. Now contrast that with the plates or the hard plate photographs. These are the cousins of the daguerreotype, the glass ambrotype, the iron tin type. These are personal. These are made for giving as a personal gift. Part of the allure of these images is that the technology of the times reversed the photograph. This was a real problem later on when US and CS buckles were backwards, but they served a purpose. If I was giving someone a gift, or if you were giving someone the gift of an amber type or a tin type, you were giving them your reflection. That is a personal, intimate gift. So here's a great description by Don Keyes of the Art Journal, giving a hard play portrait, again, personal and intimate gesture. The images were easily carried on a person. They were about this big. You could put them in your pocket, your vest pocket. A woman could put them in her dress. Um, the lateral reversal, that backwards idea, was familiar only to the sitter. It's the mirror image that you're giving as a gift. So very different giving an ambrotype or a tintype versus a card photograph. Of course, you didn't have to choose. You didn't have to necessarily pick one or the other when you walked into a photographer's studio. You could get one to send home to mom and dad for the fireplace mantle, and then you could get a dozen or two dozen of the card photographs to hand out to your pards. So, question becomes, how popular were they? This bar chart, I think, will help us. The daguerreotypes, sort of at the end of their life in green, you can see over the years of the war as they fade in popularity. Ambrotypes, those glass plate, beautiful glass images, they remain relatively popular, but you see them declining. Tintypes were sort of always sitting out there, um, a little bit of a name recognition problem. They weren't called tintypes until after the Civil War. During the war, we called them ferrotypes or melanotypes. So they just sort of sit around there, middling, and then the red bar for the carts de visite, the CDVs, you can see how they skyrocket. By the end of the war, it's the most popular choice for a photograph. Third question, why did they pose this way? Let's start with technology. Exposure times, still 15 or more seconds to get a photograph taken. There's a bunch of variables that we're talking about here. Um, the weather, is it humid, is it not humid? Is it a sunny day, is it not a sunny day? all of these science and meteorological conditions, the mix of chemicals, keep your chemicals clean, all of these would have an impact on how you would have your photograph taken. And of course, for that reason, it's not necessarily gonna make you, it, it's not set up for spontaneity. You know, you're not gonna be uh, clowning around with your friends. You're gonna be more likely to hold a pose that you can hold for some number of seconds. Having said that, <laughs> there's always a wise guy in the crowd. <laughs> this, by the way, if you follow uh, the 
platform, Reddit, social media platform, um, has gone viral twice. <laughs> People seem to not get, not get tired of this image. I wish I, wish I, could, I wish I knew who he was. I do not know his name, um, but I love it. Now, a second answer to the question is the sincerest form of flattery you imitate. What you know, think about this. Photography is in its first generation, and individuals, if we were all alive back then, where would you get your visuals from? Books that had engravings. You could go to a local art gallery if you had one in your town and see a painting. There were itinerant artists that traveled across the country making paintings. So that was the world that many of these folks were living in as photography was gaining traction in the 1840s and the 1850s. So if you saw a picture of Washington, you might think, well, you know, I'm gonna, gonna try to act like, like he's acting. Now, I'm not saying that McClellan didn't think of himself as a Washington, but he might have. <laughs> um, same thing with other paintings that you might see. You gain inspiration from what you see, and then, of course, <laughs> you're going to imitate it because it's fun, or it depends upon how you want to be seen because you're... In a way, this is a bit of a performance. Think of it when you pose for a photograph. You're going to pose the way you want people to see you pose. Same thing is true today as it was back then. Another answer to this question is your photographer, your friendly neighborhood photographer. He's like your doctor. Your doctor makes a recommendation, and you're probably going to listen. You might have put, put a little bit of a fuss up but you're gonna to listen to what your doctor says and you're gonna to listen to what your photographer has to say. One of those photographers is a man with a great name, Marcus Aurelius Root. He is a pioneer, a Daguerrean. He thought of himself as an artist and he wrote a book, basically a handbook, and it has this really long name, but all you need to know is that it's a handbook for photographers, and tucked away towards the back of that handbook are six tips which will make you a better photographer. So I want to go through those six tips right now. I'm going to spare you the deeply Victorian language because it would go on for many, many slides. Uh, and I've, I've basically abbreviated this down to more simplistic language. So here we go. One, the figure should be off-center. Why is that? Well, if you put something in the center, it tends to be a little bit less exciting. It's not quite as engaging because the person is right in the middle. You want to have a little bit of negative space on either side. So this young Confederate soldier here, standing a little bit off center, and in fact, the gun, the long arm that he carries is also off center. Number two. The distance between the lens and the figure should be greater than the figure and the backdrop. Why? Because a little bit of distance and a little bit closer up to the backdrop makes you look bigger and more powerful. And there's a belief that people want that. And so if you look at this image, the interesting painted backdrop that's perched behind this soldier the heels of his brogans are literally kicking up against the back of it. So get as close as you can to the background to make you look a little bit more inflated. Number three, the distance between the top and the bottom of the figure should not be equal. You always want more space at the top of the photograph. Why? Because it makes you look taller. And the belief is you want to look taller. And you look taller and you're closer to the background and you look more imposing. So that's a good, this is a good example of this young man who is dressed up uh, in a military costume. Now, number four, the figure should be composed in an engaging manner. So folks don't always like to see an image that is you got your hands at your side. You probably wouldn't do that for a photograph. So there are many different ways to handle that. In this case, they had him cradling his weapon. 
the figure should be lit at a 45 degree angle. Why is that? Why is that important? Well, when you aim the light down at a certain angle, one side of your face is going to be lit up and the other side is going to be in shadow. And that combination creates a three dimensional quality that makes the face look more human and more rounded rather than flat. So photographers are making sure that they have those figures located in such a way where the lighting can show them to their best, most well-rounded quality. Last but not least, when all else fails, keep it simple. Have someone sitting there, try to be more of like a documentarian, just keep it simple. Now, I want to go to personal style, yet another example. If you took hundreds, thousands of Civil War portrait photographs and looked at them, you could possibly group them into two different categories, restrained versus martial. An intern uh, for the national, um, uh, a national park ranger did a study with that idea in mind, and he came up with this theory, this restrained versus martial. So let's start with restrained. So the theory goes, if you're restrained, which means you're not showcasing your military aspects per se, and look at this photograph here. The focus is on this man's face. His sword is cradled, and it's sort of pointing out of the picture. It's not necessarily the central focus. The central focus is him, and he's quietly sitting there. He has that sword going off to the side, and it values, according to the theory, it values faith, it values family, and it values business success. So it's the person who is first, and they are picking up arms, whether it's for the union or the Confederacy. They have the arms, which suggests their military affiliation, but it really talks about them. Here's the contrast. Marshall, look at this guy. He's got everything. He's got a sword. He's got a long arm. He's got some revolvers tucked in there. He's got everything. And he's holding them up in such a way, they're literally covering his face. He has to move his head a little bit to make room for all of this. So there's no question that the idea of physical domination, according to this theory, is what this person, what this individual wants you to see and wants you to know about him. As if that wasn't enough, look at the little table, which is moved slightly to the front. You can see the hardy hat with the crossed sabers for the cavalry and the ostrich plume feather. He wants you to know that he's in the cavalry. That's his branch of service. So very much a martial look. Now, I want to get a little bit into how the war impacted portrait photography in the two parts of the country. So in the north, the industry a booming wartime economy continued to dominate. The idea of living in a world of mass production, mass media, mass transportation, photography, railroads, all of the mills and factories that were growing, they were changing the nation, they were changing the culture, and that continued unabated throughout the war, even though large, a large percentage, large numbers of military-aged men were leaving their towns, leaving those factories to volunteer for service, and a number of women were also uh, suspending their work to become, uh, to make supplies, to raise funds, some of them to become nurses. It's a fairly significant amount of the population that became consumed by the war and dedicated to it. Still, the northern economy and the volume of workers available, available was able to continue all this going. So photography was no exception. It continued to be widely available, and it grew during the Civil War. In the South, it's not the same situation. Winfield Scott, 
gets credit. I'm not sure if he deserves full credit for it, but his anaconda plan, the idea of choking off the South by a blockade at sea and closing off the Mississippi was incredibly, had a high impact on the Southern economy. That and the combination of the Union armies that were moving into the southern states put a chokehold on the economy and began to have serious consequences for everyone. And of course, luxury items like photography were among the earliest items that were affected. I use Richmond as a case in point to give you some sense, and I'll set this up by saying Richmond, of all cities in the South, um, remained in Confederate uh, hands until the last days. It had a concentration, a rapidly growing concentration of wealth and power, both political and military. And so of all cities in the southern states, Richmond would be one that you would think would not suffer quite so much as other places in the Confederate states. So in 1861 and 1862, photographers thrived. They had plenty of chemicals. They had everything that they needed to make photographs. And they had an enormous clientele. Think about all the encampments around the Richmond area. There were no, uh, no lack of military men to pose for photographs. And of course, they wanted to pose for their photographs because they wanted to send those images home to mom and dad, brother, sister, husband to show what they looked like in uniform. Now, in 1863, we begin to see a decline. First, a lot of those clients, those military men, are now leaving to come here to Pennsylvania, come up into Maryland, to go to other parts of the Confederacy, other parts of Virginia. So you see a loss in the clientele. At the same time, the blockade and other incursions are beginning to take effect, and you start to see galleries who are closing their doors during this time period because they do not have the supplies to be able to do what they want to do. By February of 1864, the situation becomes acute. Arguably, the leading photographer in Washington, Charles Ricard Rees, is placing newspaper ads offering these wildly inflated prices to get his hands on photographic chemicals. Meanwhile, he's getting called away to serve in the Richmond Defense Forces and can no longer run his gallery. His brother takes uh, charge of the gallery while he's away protecting the Richmond area. So at this point, if this is the situation in Richmond, you can imagine around the rest of the Confederacy, by that time, most of the chemicals have dried up. Many of the cities, the key cities are now occupied. And if there are photographers, they're mostly northern photographers or southern photographers who are taking photographs of Union soldiers and sailors. So interestingly, after Richmond Falls in April 1865, within a matter of weeks, the supply chain kicks back in. Photographic chemicals become back into the city and you begin to see the opportunity for photographs to happen. So what does this mean to what you see? Most of the images of Confederate soldiers that we see that exist today look like these guys here. Look at the differences in their uniforms. No two are alike. And you may be wondering, why is that? Because you're looking at them in 1861, for the most part, before the army, or as the army was forming, these guys were in local militias, local militia companies that then worked up through the state government, and each militia company had its own jurisdiction, and of course, they wanted to have distinctive and unique uniforms. And you may have heard, uh, at the first Battle of Bull Run, or Manassas, as you prefer, uh, there were so many different styles of uniforms, both north and south, 
uh, in the South, these uniforms were preserved visually in a way that the Northern uniforms weren't because photography continued in the North. Many of these militia uniforms quickly disappeared and you saw in the National, the Union Army, they wore the blue and it became pretty rapidly consistent. And the same thing happened in the South, but we see more of these images because there's not photographs to show as many of these images in their classic Confederate gray and butternut. Now, don't get me wrong, these images still exist, but you see an awfully lot of these photographs. Part of the reason you see those photographs in the gray and butternut uniforms we know today is that at the end of the war, middle of 1865, many of these men wanted to pose one more time in their uniforms. So we can pretty much know that this officer posed in his uniform probably in the summer up until the early fall when the federal government said, hey, you can no longer wear the insignia on your collar and your cuffs and those brass buttons have to be taken off. You can still wear your gray coat, but you can't have any insignia on it. So we're looking at a soldier here that's probably from that mid to latter part of 1865. A number of the images you see are like that. Also of interest is this is a card photograph or a carte de visite. It's not an ambra type or a tin type. So when these guys had a chance to go into a studio at the war's end, they gravitated towards the carte de visite because that was the social media and they wanted to hand them out to all their friends, that one last photograph. Now, to sort of take this home for you to appreciate it, here's a look at uh, 869 identified portraits, um, the blue and the gray, US and CS, and you can see the carte de visite dominates 74% of the existing images we surveyed are Union CDVs. 18% are the paper photographs for Confederates. Ambrotypes in the Union, 7% versus 54% for the Confederate soldiers. And tintypes are 28%. So those gray bars for those hard plate images, those personal intimate objects, those are the ones that dominate. So it sort of proves the point. Now, parting shot, and then I'm gonna take your questions. I did a study. I looked at all, uh, my, my idea was how many carte de visite photographs were produced during the war on the Union side because they had a consistent supply of chemicals and photographers, it was a constant. So I looked at the Union Army and I thought, if a bunch of these guys, almost everybody posed for one photograph when they enlisted, and then in the middle of the war, they would pose for a second photograph, and then one last photograph at the end of the war. This is assuming they survived, right? Um, so the number that I come up with, and this is not the generals, it's not the politicians, it's not the battlefield photographers, this is just only the soldiers, 40 million. Now. Let's figure conservatively that 10% of those images have survived the ravages of time. They didn't get drowned in a basement or burned up in an attic. Let's say that 10% existed. That means that 4 million of these images are out here today. And getting back to what I said at the very beginning of this presentation, we have seen those battlefield photography images for 160 years. These images have largely been hidden away in families and in private collections. It wasn't really until the 1960s, the centennial of the Civil War, that families begin to lose connections with the men in the photographs. They forget who they are, and then they show up in flea markets and garage sales and antique shops and Civil War shows like the one that was here last week down the street and they become collectible and people begin to buy them because they realize there's something really important about the faces that you see and the ones that are identified, you begin to understand their story, their sacrifice, what they did, what they believed, what they didn't believe. So 
we're still out there today looking for these images. There are applications like Civil War Photo Sleuth, which is civilwarphotosleuth.com, um, which is a, uses artificial intelligence um, and face recognition technology to identify images. So there's a lot of really cool things going on right now out there to try to identify as many of these faces as we can. And there's a large group of people, researchers, genealogists, and other historians who are engaged in this activity. So we're all excited by the idea there could be four million photographs. We would love to find them all. If you think that number is a lot, in the next two minutes, you can take more photos as a total taken in the entire. <laughs> and there you go, you're taking one of those photographs right now. <laughs> Thank you. So on that note, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Ron. We'll, we'll also say, based on your recommendation, Dr. Kurt Luther of Photo Sleuth came here last he year and did the presentation, which is now on uh, the Gettysburg Foundation's YouTube channel for last year's presentation for Sacred Trust. So, thank all right. You. Well, Ron, we're going to send Ron in to sign books. So, Ron, thank you very much. I guess, I guess I'll just do the announcements from this mic. Okay, so the next presentation will be in this tent. It'll be Colonel Doug Dowds, United States Marine Corps, retired, also a licensed battlefield guide, one of our colleagues here who'll be talking about command structure compared between Lee and George Meade. So it should be interesting. Three o'clock in this tent. Please, if you're not a member of the Friends of the National Parks of Gettysburg, Gettysburg Foundation, go join at the Friends desk. They'd love to have you support these programs and donations out front in the box for my colleagues. We just appreciate all they do. So thank you for being here. We hope you'll come back at 3 o'clock for Colonel Doug Downs. Thank you.